The concept of flux is surprisingly useful. Consider Gauss's law, which relates electric flux through a surface to the enclosed charge. For simple, symmetric charge arrangements in surfaces, Gauss's law is an incredibly powerful tool for finding the electric field. But what if things aren't nice and clean, like a sphere around a point charge, or a prism through an infinite plate? How would one go about using Gauss's law with ugly surfaces and ugly fields? We will use Gauss's law as an example merely for convenience, but keep in mind that flux has many varied applications. Generally, the question we would like to answer is how to calculate the flux of an arbitrary field through an arbitrary surface. To accomplish this seemingly inconvenient task, we must deploy a new kind of integral, the surface integral. Similar to a line integral which calculates the field along a path, the surface integral finds the amount of field that is perpendicular to a surface, which, in physics terms, is the flux. In order to integrate some field e of x, y, z over a surface, z equals f of x, y, there are two challenges which must be overcome, finding unit normal vectors to the surface as a function of x, y, and z, and finding a means of actually integrating over the surface. Taking the dot product of the field in the unit normal vector will find the amount of field e perpendicular to the surface. To find the unit normal, it is sufficient to find two vectors tangent to the plane and take their cross product. Partial derivatives can find the slope of tangent lines in the x and y directions. Consider a vector of arbitrary length a in the x direction. A tangent vector will then have a z component, df dx times a. By symmetry, we can also find such a vector in the y direction. And taking the cross product, and then normalizing, we can get a unit normal vector. Armed with the unit normal in field, we need to integrate, an operation which is not readily apparent for an ugly surface. We can begin in a reasonable manner by approximating the surface with n rectangles tangent to the surface, and approximate the flux as the field evaluated at the point of tangency, dotted with the normal vector at that point, and multiplied by the area of the rectangle. As the number of approximating rectangles gets larger, the approximation gets better, and it makes sense that in the limit, the sum will equal the surface integral. We still don't have any way to systematically deal with those tiny rectangles of surface, but what if we instead consider the projection of the surface onto a two-dimensional plane? A relationship between rectangles of surface and rectangles of 2D projection will allow us to calculate the surface integral as a standard double integral over a 2D region. Consider a rectangle of surface where two sides are parallel to the plane into which we will project. These sides will have the same length in the projection. The other sides are related via the cosine of the angle the surface rectangle makes with the plane. This angle is the same angle that the normal of the surface makes with the vertical, and thus the cosine of theta can be found from the dot product of these two vectors, n hat and k hat. The area of the surface is therefore related to the area of the projected region. And since we already have an expression for the unit normal to the surface, we can rewrite the dot product and get a final result as a differential. Combining our two parts together, we find that some of the ugliness cancels out, and we have a means of taking a surface integral as a standard double integral over a projected region. Let's consider Gauss's law again. We often want to use Gauss to find the electric field, but our newfound ability to evaluate surface integrals helps us surprisingly little with this task. Given the field in a surface, we could calculate the enclosed charge, but trying to go the other way is troublesome as there is no way to solve backwards to find the field at each point on the surface. What if instead we dealt with a single point, rather than the entire surface of points? This could possibly lead us to finding the electric field. Simply taking the flux around a point is insufficient, as this will eventually tend to zero as the surface area goes to zero at a point. Instead, it is useful to consider the ratio of flux over volume as the volume goes to zero at a point. Though both these quantities go to zero, it's still mathematically feasible that the ratio will become some value. We will calculate the flux volume ratio for a rectangular prism of side length delta x, delta y, and delta z around the central point x, y, z, and then take the limit as those sides, and thus the volume, goes to zero. Consider a y, z face, whose normal vector must then be i hat. We can approximate the field of that face as the field of the center of the face at x plus delta x over 2, y, z. The component of the yz face is then e sub x of x plus delta x over 2 yz, where the sub x denotes the x or i component of e. And the flux is then that quantity times delta y delta z. Correspondingly through the opposite face, the normal is negative i hat, and we can find that flux as well. By symmetry, we can apply the same reasoning to all the other sides and find the total flux.
To get the flux per volume, we divide by delta V, which is delta X times delta Y times delta Z, but we then take the limit as dx, dy, and dz go to zero. Consider a single one of the terms in this hideous expression separately with its relevant limit. This might seem a little familiar, and well it should, as it is equivalent to the limit definition of the partial derivative, which is unsurprisingly very similar to the limit de definition of the regular derivative. We can thus rewrite the flux per volume as the sum of three partial derivatives. This quantity is known as the divergence, and it can be expressed conveniently with the del operator. Remember that del is defined as the vector of partial derivatives. The divergence is then the dot product of del with a vector field. There is a useful relationship between the divergence and surface integrals, which can be exploited to calculate the flux and develop a new form of Gauss's law. This relationship is known as the divergence theorem, and it equates surface integrals with volume integrals of the divergence. To derive this relationship, it is useful to think of a surface integral, the flux, in a different manner. Divide up the interior of the surface into a bunch of smaller volumes. The sum of the fluxes of each of these subvolumes is equivalent, in the limit, to the flux of the entire surface. To understand this, imagine two adjacent subvolumes that share a face. The flux through one subvolume associated with the shared face will cancel with the flux from the same face, but through the other subvolume. The only place where this cancelling does not occur is at the outer boundary of the surface, and thus the total flux is indeed the flux through the original surface. By multiplying this expression by delta v over delta v, and using a little bit of manipulation, we can arrive at something that looks like it might contain the divergence. Taking the limit of this expression as delta v goes to zero, or equivalently as the number of subvolumes goes to infinity, we see that the integrand does, by definition, become the divergence and the sum becomes a triple integral over the volume contained by the surface. This result is the divergence theorem, which states that the surface integral of a vector field over a closed surface is equivalent to the triple integral of the divergence of the field over the enclosed volume. The divergence theorem can be applied to the surface integral in Gauss's law. The right-hand side of Gauss's law can also be converted into a triple integral by considering the charge to be the integral of charge density over volume. Normally, there is not much additional information to be found in the equivalence of two triple integrals. The two quantities may only be the same for some specific set of volumes. But we know that Gauss's law, from which we derive this expression, must hold for all surfaces, and thus all volumes. The only way this can be true is for the integrands in both statements to also be equal. That is, the divergence of the electric field equals the charge density over permittivity. This result is known as the differential form of Gauss's law, and it reduces the task of finding the electric field to knowing the charge density at a point and solving a partial differential equation. This equation, however, has three unknowns, making it rather unsolvable. To truly find the field requires the combination of the differential form of Gauss's law and the gradient. This combination employs a new del-based operation, the Laplacian, which allows the field to be found as a partial differential equation in one unknown, but that will be a topic for another film. To finish up, let's consider a rather simple example. Given a vector field f equals 0, 0, z, what is the flux to the pyramidal surface bounded by the xy, yz, and xz planes, and the plane passing through 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1? We can solve this first as a basic surface integral problem, and then again using the divergence theorem to show that the two are equivalent. If we want to use the standard method of evaluating surface integrals, First, we need to find unit normal vectors. Note that we need only concern ourselves with the angled surface, because the flux of the other three sides will each be zero, as the field is parallel to the xz and yz planes, and has a value of zero all along the xy plane. By intuition, it is relatively clear that the normal is constant and in the direction 1, 1, 1. But for validation, we can try our more general methods. First, we need the plane as a function of x and y, which can be given as x plus y plus z equals 1, or z equals 1 minus x minus y, and can be confirmed by checking the given points. Using the equation for the normal, we find that n hat equals i hat plus j hat plus k hat over root 3, which is indeed in the direction we suspected. Of course, the root 3 is cancelled when transforming it to a standard double integral, and in the end, we will be evaluating a double integral of z. We will be integrating over the projection of the surface in the xy plane, which is the triangular region bounded by the x and y axes 
and the line y equals negative x plus 1. Setting the bounds and substituting 1 minus x minus y for z, we have a double integral which we can evaluate and which gives us an answer of 1 sixth. Alternatively, we could apply the divergence theorem. Taking the divergence of our field function f, we find that it is simply 1. We could expend some effort and evaluate the triple integral, but there is a shortcut available to us. Integrating 1 over the volume simply gives us the volume, which for a pyramid is 1 third base times height. The base is 1 half and the height is 1, giving a final result of 1 sixth, which was to be expected.